Greetings all, welcome to today's uh, video on Peter Carey's The Chance. Um, this video is just gonna be a summary video of everything that happens in the text. There's not gonna be any kind of sustained form of analysis. It's just a straight up retelling. Um, gonna get right to the point, okay? So with that in mind, I'm just gonna get started. Our story starts, like most other dystopian narratives do, with a bit of exposition and a bit of rule explaining to give us a bit of context to the world uh, that we're in. Now, the story takes place three summers or three years after the arrival of the Fastologians on Earth. Now, the Fastologians are a people or species that came from God knows what unimaginable worlds, and they arrived in, uh, in their spaceships. So it's not specified um, where they came from, but what they did when they arrived was set up what is called the Genetic Lottery, or the Chance, hence the title. Now, the chance, or the genetic lottery, is basically a process by which a person goes into a lottery room and then comes out with a different age, a different body, a different voice, and still carry our memories, allowing for a little leakage, more or less intact. So essentially what is happening is your mind is being transferred into another body, you just don't get to choose what that body is. It's, it's random, hence the genetic lottery. You know, the story is called the chance, it's not called uh, the choice. Now, our protagonist, whose name we don't get until like halfway through the story, is Paul. And he is currently spending his days in furies and tempers half drunk. Um, and this is primarily to help him sleep and deal with the uncomfortable summer climate. Yet, despite this, he acknowledges that he should be saving for a chance. So it's pretty clear that this is the concept around which the narrative revolves. This is the distinguishing feature of the world that we've been invited into. Um, but he can't save up effectively because that would mean six months without Grog or any other solace. So immediately, we know that he's a bit of a mess. Now, Paul comments that there have been times when he was prepared to join the Leapers, which, as the name suggests, is a term given to people who, rather than live in a world reshaped by the Fastologians, they leap to their deaths from buildings and bridges, etc., etc., now, he also comments that he has been overwhelmed by a feeling of great loss, which he generalizes to essentially mean that he has been and is grieving for the lost way of life that he once knew uh, before the arrival of the Fastologians. Now, the Fastologians, interestingly, um, are also likened to the Americans who preceded them. Now, he says that what the Americans did to us with their yearly car models and two weekly cigarette lighters was nothing compared to the Fastologians, who introduced concepts so dazzling that we fell prey to them wholesale, like South Sea Islanders exposed to the common cold. So the likeness being drawn here is in their power to advertise, to, to innovate, and to sell ideas and products to the masses, so much so that, as a result, they more or less control them. Um, now, with the Fastologians, this is primarily through the genetic lottery, or the chance. Now, we also get a bit of information on the Fastologians themselves. They are described as persuasive, eager, frenetic almost, and less threatening than the Americans, which is attributed to the fact that they were generally poorly dressed and generally lonely and puzzled, all of this resulting in the perception that while they controlled us, we managed to feel a smiling superiority to them. Now, with the concept of the chance, Paul remarks that as a people, generally, we were used to not understanding. Now, what this meant was that without fully understanding what the chance was or what the genetic lottery was, and indeed how it worked, people still largely paid for it, and they paid for it several times. Now, this was a habit, evidently, that had been formed through their exposure to the Fastologians' predecessors, the Americans. And the concept of the chance was so incredible that it precipitated the total embrace of a cancerous philosophy of change. Everyone was doing it. Now, with this decision to just up and transfer your mind into another body, which is essentially killing off your own identity and then rebirthing yourself through another one, relationships and dynamics that were at the foundation of society began to disintegrate. So families, marriages, uh, neighbors, and even religious groups, these were only some of the relationships that cracked and split apart in the face of a new shrill current of desperate selfishness. So the destabilization of society, at least as it was once known, was such that it resulted in society being comprised of little more than an edgy and distrustful group of people, motivated by nothing but self-preservation and their blind belief in their next chance. So if you think about that for a moment, 
It's a pretty surreal concept. You know, you're in a world where it's indeed possible to jump into another body and completely leave behind your old life, for better or for worse, um, and start anew with another identity, inhabiting a new body. Now, regardless of how that would affect this world, um, the portrayal in this story is certainly that everyone would go for it, and even several times. And as a result, society would no longer be what it once was. If you're too short, take a chance. If you're too ugly, take a chance. If you're scared of your wife, take a chance. Now, it's important to note that the Fastologians are not depicted directly in this story. We never really see one, um, and they're not really portrayed as evil either. They're simply, they're simply salespeople, um, interested only in a highly favorable intergalactic balance of payments. Now, a chance costs 2,000 intergalactic dollars. What they're selling just happens to be something that completely reshapes society, um, and evidently not for the better. Now, we also learn that our protagonist has undergone at least one chance himself. Now, Paul remarks, my face in the mirror that morning was not the face my mind had started living with. No, he says, I had been through the lottery and lost, and now resided in the body of an aging street fighter. Now, we also know that he's a gardener, uh, but he doesn't actually garden a lot. Uh, instead, he plays cards with others, and this is at least in part due to the fact that even the gardens are slowly being choked by a prickly bush that was imported by the Fastologians, and rather than remove it, which was their job, they use it as a cover for their own activities. Now, in any case, it is from these botanical gardens that Paul walks back to the boarding house in which he lives, um, some beer in tow. Um, and this is when he first sights her. Now, we find out later that her name is Carla, and she is sitting on the footpath with the formally dressed corpse of an old man who Paul assumes to be her grandfather, which, by the way, is not an uncommon sight. Evidently, it was common for poor people to raise money for funerals by displaying dead bodies in rented suits. Now, he stops by her, um, he offers her a beer, which she accepts, and then they enjoy a good old beverage together. Now, Carla reveals that the corpse is not, in fact, her grandfather, but rather the best investment I've ever made, which she bought for three intergalactic bucks. Now, this amuses him so much so that they end up sitting together until they drink all the beer he had. He wonders if she had ever taken a chance, but decides it wasn't likely. Um, and when they finish the beers, um, she offers him a meal in return. And then they leave together, um, leaving the formerly dressed corpse behind. Now, the two of them go to a fast Logian cafe. The meal is on her, and they get on really well. Indeed, he remarks, I bathed in her beauty. And while his perception is that she was strong and young and confident, his description um, of himself is that he was as calculating and cunning as only the very lonely learn how to be. Now, by this, he is referring to the extent to which he steers and manipulates the conversation so that he is only kind of impressing her while simultaneously avoiding the more self-hating aspects of his personality. Now he says, my conversation was mirrors within mirrors. Now that is until eventually they discuss the chance or the genetic lottery for the lottery was life in those days and all of us, most of us, were saving for another chance. So Carla reveals that she's taking a chance the following week and he reveals that he's had four chances. She explains that she wants a people's body and this prompts him to identify her as a hup. What's a hup, you say? I'm glad you asked. Now, according to Paul, a hup is a revolutionary crackpot or a rich crazy who thought the way to fight the revolution was to have a body as grotesque and ill-formed as possible. Now, why do the hops want to overthrow the Fastologians? Because they sympathize with the proletariat or the working class, uh, the majority of society, um, which is not the upper class. Um, but clearly, he finds her beautiful, and clearly, though he doesn't express it in as many words, he objects to her taking a chance because he doesn't want her to change and become ugly. Um, all he says is, you've got a beautiful body. This guy. Now, this prompts her to ask him, what do you think is beautiful? Then she uses a parrot and a crow as an example, suggesting that the crow is often thought less beautiful than the parrot, but this may be due to the fact that people generally don't know how to listen to a crow. Uh, which speaks ignorance more than it speaks a lesser degree of beauty. Now, in any case, this debate over what is beautiful causes some very noticeable tension and discomfort between the two of them, and this seems to exhaust him. Paul thinks, uh, in a world of ideas, I had no principles. An idea was of no worth to me, not worth fighting for. I would fight for a beer, a meal, a woman, but never an idea. 
So the distinction we see uh, between them here is that she's idealistic and he is comparatively materialistic. He's subscribed to a more stereotypical definition of beauty, whereas she seems to condemn disparities between perceptions of beauty, hence why she is a hup. Um, she's one of those beauty is in the eye of the beholder um, people, which, which is true. I don't know why I said it that way. But anyway, she asks him if taking a chance hurts. Um, and he says it's more of a head thing uh, and that she might vomit a lot. She then just warns him, if you have anything to do with me, it'll be a hard time for your head too. Um, so obviously implying or even foreshadowing uh, the tension and the drama that will take place between them because of their conflicting ideologies. Um, if it can be said that he has one. Now the two of them then continue to get on well, um, so much so that he actually ends up moving in with her. Despite how happy this makes him, Paul foreshadows an unfortunate future when he says, regarding the events that followed, I feel neither pride nor shame. Regret, certainly, but regret is a useless emotion. I was ignorant, short-sighted, bigoted, but in my situation, it is inconceivable that I could have been anything else. So he spends a bit of time um, describing Carla's place, which is in a word, average. Um, he says of her that she was born rich but chose to live poor, an idea that was beyond my experience or comprehension. So her place very much reflects this with its dozens of small signs of domesticity, um, but one of the key things to come out here was that, um, this is Paul saying this, I was happy to see what I was shown and never worried about what was hidden away. So this is interesting because um, on that surface level, it's referring to her place, but obviously this is something that can also apply to Carla herself, and certainly uh, towards their relationship. Now, life together, at least from his perspective, from Paul's perspective, is great. He's infatuated with Carla. He thinks himself the luckiest guy in the world. Um, she does not, in fact, take a chance the following week, uh, which prompts him to think that she's put it off indefinitely, because people rarely plunged into the rigors of the lottery when they were happy with their life. Now, during their time together, Carla attempts to educate Paul with an artillery of Hup literature. Um, he doesn't learn all that much, though, apparently. Now, in any case, Paul becomes a sort of housekeeper uh, in the home and even attempts to clean up the place, but this includes discarding posters for Hup meetings, which have already passed. But when Carla sees this, she gets angry at him for getting rid of them, accusing him of doing it because he thought that the people on them were just ugly. Now this only angers him and so naturally uh, they fight, they start bloody throwing books at one another and she's accusing him of only liking her because she's pretty and he's kind of over that and he says that she's too young to know what these people are really like. Now this only makes her reaffirm that she is a hup and that she's taking a chance which in turn makes him reaffirm his objection to it. He thinks, I began to plot to keep her in the body she was born in. It became my obsession. Now the next night, uh, Paul returns home to find that Carla has a bunch of hups over, as in a collection of people as romantically ugly as any I'd ever seen. Um, basically, they're just super duper ugly, but they're dressed up in such a way that their faults and infirmities were displayed with a pride that would have been alien to any but a hup. Now while he is more or less disgusted by this, Carla, however, has her eyes shining with enthusiasm and admiration uh, for those around her. Now, Carla introduces Paul to several of the hups and he is predictably uncomfortable and doesn't really know how to interact with them. While Carla and the rest of the hups are waiting to have a meeting, um, Paul ends up going fishing. And while he's there, he thinks that the hups who are with Carla are concluding plans to take Carla away from me. He ends up catching several fish, but he ends up letting most of them go back into the water. Now, Paul and Carla are in bed. Um, she's been crying, her chance is coming up, and while he keeps encouraging her to put it off, she says that if she doesn't stick to the appointment, she's gonna have to wait for another six months. Now, his argument is that they're happy, and that if she goes through with it, the two of them won't last together. Now, additionally, he calls them all ugly, referring to the hups, and she would never wanna sleep with one of them. Now, she's all, that's my business, uh, which leads him to accuse her of infidelity. She punches him, he punches her back, and then he says that the reason he loves her is because we'll both have black eyes. Now, consider the symbolism there. After that, she laughs and he cries. Uh, now, Paul then starts a journal, but he only writes in it for one page. And on that page, he reaffirms his love for Carla uh, and he counts down the days to her chance. 10 days to go. I've got work to do. 
Remember, he's been plotting to keep her from taking a chance. The next Wednesday comes along, which evidently is meeting day for the freaks. What an ass. Um, Paul is surprised to find that no one is home except for a hook-nosed lady. It's important to note that at this point, um, Paul has had some shrooms, um, and this is to kind of to calm him down, or that's why he took them. Um, in any case, the hook-nosed lady starts to talk to Paul. Um, he wants to go fishing, but he can't until his frozen mints, which he uses to make bait, um, thaws. Now, the hook-nosed lady says that he shouldn't be upset with Carla. Um, she says, we don't forget how to make love when we change. Uh, now, meanwhile, this whole time, um, she's kind of doing a bit of a sneaky and moving closer to him, kind of caressing her, uh, his knee with, with her hand. Um, and all the while, uh, the shrooms are starting to kind of hit him. Um, so the hook-nosed lady propositions Paul, saying that she could show him that he has nothing to fear and that it is something quite extraordinary, um, that is, to make love to a hup. Now, in his mind, Paul's thinking, I knew exactly in the depth of my clouded mind what was happening. I didn't resist it. I didn't want to resist it. Now, I'm not going to go into, <laughs> into the graphic detail um, about that, but suffice it to say that the hook-nosed lady um, starts to fondle him um, and then straddles him. And while he's not repulsed by it, he's, and he's thinking he normally would be, he finally, he finally comes to her and he gets her off of him. And this breaks the kind of trans-like state that he was in, um, and she becomes livid. So the hook-nosed lady reveals that before she took the chance, she was the once beautiful and famous actress, Jane LaRange. Now, Paul is perplexed by her choice to go from that to, well, you know, a hook-nosed lady. She confesses that we will kill the fasters, uh, referring to the fastologians, obviously, and we will kill their puppets and their leeches. Now, Paul then goes back to preparing baits. Uh, evidently, the mince has thawed. Jane reveals that the seduction was actually Carla's idea and also that she did it to make Carla feel better and that regardless of what happened, she would report back to Carla and say that it was a success um, as the lie will make her happy for a little while at least. Now Jane pretty much just tells Paul to take your nasty bait and go and kill fish, um, essentially kicking him out of his own house <laughs> before their meeting. Um, he leaves. Apparently his junk is still hanging out of his fly, and this makes the dwarf, who was another hup um, outside, um, this makes him laugh at him. Okay, moving on, Paul then decides to tell Carla the truth about the encounter between him and the hook-nosed lady. Um, her response, however, is to take photos of each of them by the pier, the same pier where he's been fishing, uh, I guess. Um, weird reaction. Um, she asks him if he loves her, uh, and he says yes, but this only makes her cry and throw the camera into the water. She runs back inside, and Paul doesn't bother asking her what the problem is. Now we've got five days left until Carla's chance. Um, now Paul cooks, he cleans, he shows Carla videotapes he knows she likes, all to no avail. Um, she's in a bit of a state, uh, her eyes pale and staring, and she's kind of sitting there unresponsive like a blind deaf mute. Um, and this makes Paul mad. Eventually, um, Carla comes back to herself and says that she loves him, um, and he says that he loves her. Um, and at first they agree not to talk about it. Carla says that there's no point because she's going to do it anyway, uh, referring to her chance. And so Paul kind of reiterates or reaffirms at that point that she's not going to take a chance. So their positions, their conflicting ideologies here are kind of, they're reaffirmed here. Um, and at that moment, they both hold each other and weep whispering things that mad people say to one another. This next sequence is the shortest in the text. Um, so bloody sad. Basically, Paul and Carla are making love and she's just crying in his ear saying, tell me I'm beautiful. That's really sad. Anyway, Paul watches Carla in bed, presumably the next morning, um, thinking not only of how beautiful she is, but of how it was unbelievable that this should be taken from us. Now, it's during his observation of her that he hatches a plan to keep her from taking a chance. Now, his plan is to build a door which would snap shut and essentially imprison her just long enough to miss her appointment for a chance. Now, he knows it's crazy. He says that his plan has all the telltale signs of total madness, but despite this, uh, he was desperate. And it was the simplest means by which he thought he could keep her. Now, Paul even takes time off work to build his door, um, and when Carla asks about it, he blames it on an imaginary carpenter, he blames it on the painters, he blames it on the landlords, um, he blames it on someone else just to get her to stop talking about it. Um, 
in the end they end up drinking um, drinking beer and getting drunk. Uh, in the next section, we've got the dwarf um, who catches Paul working on the door, and indeed he does know that it's a door. Um, he encourages Paul to see someone like a counselor or a shrink, um, and he also encourages him to join the Hups um, to help bring about a future where there's no need for, for locks um, and where he could spend his energy on bigger and more important things. Now to this, Paul just tells the dwarf to go and F himself, um, after which point uh, Paul leaves uh, and goes to, the, goes to the pier where he fishes, um, and he does this until the dwarf leaves. Um, after the dwarf leaves, Paul then returns to continue working on his door. Now, with the door built, uh, Paul tries to frighten Carla one last time, saying that if she goes through with the chance, she'll basically be throwing away a life together, one that she'll never be able to reclaim or resemble ever again. Now, he condemns her schoolgirl morality and says that whatever life she leads on the other side of her chance will be a lesser one. They each accuse each other of not understanding. In any case, that is the last night that they, uh, that they sleep together. Now, as it turns out, Carla does not, in fact, get trapped uh, by Paul's door. Instead, she leaves him only with a letter on what would have been their last night together. Evidently, she lied about the date of her chance and she left a day earlier. Now, in the letter, Carla explains that she has to be with her parents, who are also hups, um, who could also be anyone, even beggars in the streets. She says that the reason she wants to go through with the chance and renounce her body is because she thinks that her looks have afforded her an easy life. So the implication there is that she felt she felt like an easy life was kind of was kind of wrong. Um, she professes her love for Paul and how much she will miss him, and then she out. Now Paul crumples up the note. He runs through the streets toward the chance center, thinking it would be funny for me to die of a heart attack. Now, whether he means that physically or emotionally after reading uh, the letter, that's anyone's guess. Now, at the Chance Center, uh, Paul experiences the smell of trauma. He sees homeless people, he sees patients being wheeled in and out by fast logian technicians. He waits the entire morning, but he doesn't see Carla or her name on any of the video display terminals. In the afternoon, he buys a six-pack and mylocaine capsules. Not gonna lie, I don't know what those are, some kind of drug that he's hopped up on. Um, and then he leaves. Now, in the dark of the night, um, Paul is awoken in a half-drunk, half-conscious kind of state to an overweight, weeping woman sitting in a chair by the bed. You guessed it, that's Carla after her chance. Now, in his state, though, Paul pretends not to notice, to still be asleep, um, which he is also retrospectively uh, ashamed of. He says it is unreasonable that such a test should come in such a way. By morning, however, she is gone, leaving only a pair of her large gray knickers wet with the juices of her unacceptable desire. Um, he puts them in the bin, uh, and then he goes out to buy some more beer. Now we see Paul again when he is fishing on the pier, contemplating what to do about Carla's house. Um, he is approached by the dwarf, who offers him a gift. Evidently, it was customary for people who took the chance to give their friends pieces of clothing from their old bodies, clothing that they expected wouldn't fit the new. Now the gift just happens to be a brown paper parcel inside of which is a pair of white ladies knickers. You can guess whose they are. Um, and interestingly, it's a point of comparison with the previous pair that was left for him. Um, he doesn't throw this one away. He merely shakes the dwarf's hand. Now the final chapter is some distance from the rest of the narrative. Um, Paul alludes to a revolution that took place during which time the dwarf was tortured and a fat woman was known as a fierce warrior. Possibly that woman was Carla. Um, at this time, however, Paul is a crazy old man alone with his books and his beers and his dog. Now the story ends with Paul saying that he has been through many chances, uh, but that one thing has always remained consistent. Uh, this one pain, this one yearning that I love you, my lady, with all my heart. And on evenings when the water is calm and the birds dive amongst the white bait, my eyes swell with tears as I think of you sitting on a chair beside me, weeping in a darkened room. And there's the final lines. That's it. That's the end of our story. The Chance by Peter Carey. Now, I would challenge you, firstly, to consider um, what those final lines convey, um, what they suggest about where Paul is at emotionally, um, kind of at that point. And that may frame your interpretation of, of, of the wider narrative. Um, I'll leave it there though. Um, thanks for watching. I'll catch you later. Bye.